Hey, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Brian Sullivan in lovely Maryland. Hey, hello, Brian. John, how are you, sir? Yeah, and I'm here as always in, in lovely San Diego. Um, Brian is the Vice President uh, uh, at uh, Sandler Enterprise uh, Selling. Sandler is one of the, the oldest and most well-known um, sales training organizations uh, in the world. And uh, Brian is also co-author of the book, uh, Enterprise Selling, Winning and Growing Enterprise Accounts. And what we wanted to talk today was particularly in the context of enterprise selling is the concept of how to make go or no go decisions uh, and then how to do proper win loss uh, win loss analysis so, so Brian when it comes to enterprise selling right uh, there's a lot of resources that often go into winning a deal right so there's a lot of cost and opportunity cost associated with deciding to go after a deal and how long you go after it right no absolutely John um, you know, it, it's a significant investment that you make as an organization when you pull the trigger and go after one of these deals. I mean, and most people think about the financial investment, obviously, you know, the, the, the money that you have to commit to go after one of these deals. But but it's so much more. I mean, your, your human assets, when you're going after one of these deals, you're applying people who have day jobs to the pursuit, to the proposal development. And then there's the, the organizational energy just in general. I mean, how many of these deals can you credibly go after at any one point in time by marshalling all the assets of your organization? So it's a significant decision that you're making because of everything that you're spending to go after it. So, um, so what are some strategies that you help organizations with put in place to be better at making those no uh, go, no go decisions? Because let's face it, uh, I mean, mostly salespeople are pretty optimistic. You have to be to be in that job, right? And every opportunity often looks like a good opportunity. So, how do you? What do you put in place or criteria for deciding whether to go or no go? Yeah, and you make a great point. I mean, sales reps would certainly have you go after every deal, right? It's a, uh, you know, they have wonderful uh, logic. You know, hey, it's right in our power swing, or it's ours to lose, and a lot of lot of emotional reasons to go after a deal, but. Uh, we feel strongly it's all about having a uh, having a logical framework to follow, <clears throat> and we have some some really key areas that we think you need to focus on, and and, and we don't suggest that you take six months off. <clears throat> excuse me, take six months off to figure out whether or not to go after these deals, but to make to make a streamlined decision as a team as to which are the right deals to go after and which are not. So, do you think that most because uh, most organizations, if you <clears throat> ask them, you would say. Yeah, who's your target customer? And they would give you some some concept of what their target customer is. But do you think that a lot most organizations really go down to that next level and really work out what are the characteristics of a really good piece of business and how does that compare and use it as a kind of measuring stick against opportunities? Well, I think I think it really depends on the gravity and the size of the deal, John. Um, I mean, certainly, I wouldn't suggest that you evaluate. 40 different business issues for relatively trivial deals but you know some some deals 40 business issues being evaluated will be far too few uh i mean you know that you look at the the deal that was just let by the i mean the US Department of the Army uh where they where they had uh, the for the um the mobile radio command deal two different 467 million dollar awards i guarantee you that you know Harris Technologies and Motorola in bidding on those deals they evaluated a lot more than 40 business issues. So it's really, it really scales, John. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing that you touched on at the beginning <clears throat> there, and, and this is something that's always been um, an issue of mine, is that um, you know people don't always calculate in the real cost of going after a piece of business, right? So yeah, I, I, borrow, I borrow somebody from this department, somebody from that department. Can you do me, I'm working on this deal. Can you do me a favor? Can you spend a little time on this? And before you know it, there's all these additional resources that are included, um, that are involved rather, but we rarely calculate them. They're always kind of in the background. So, um, you know, is that something that you often see that people don't really know how much is going into pursuing an opportunity? 
Uh, absolutely. You know, for the for the direct expenses, you know, where you need to uh, rent a team of technical writers, you know, at 92 bucks an hour per person, that's real obvious. You kind of get that one. But when you're borrowing people from the accounting and finance group to come over and, and give you a little bit of their time here and there, well, first of all, that's all they're giving you. But there's an opportunity cost to them being pulled away from their day job. So it's a really significant issue, and it can cause a lot of internal consternation, right? You know, although there might be a cultural focus on team selling, and the accounting VP is not going to be real happy about, about having some actuarial folks brought over to help you go after a deal. Yeah. So how much does... Um, having a good way of selecting deals or deselecting deals, how much does that then play into win-loss analysis later? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Uh, if you think about it, what, what we propose is there's three different areas of business issues that you'll evaluate. Selling team issues, client issues, and financing and contract issues. And you evaluate all these issues in your go-no-go -no -go to determine if you're stable with the issue or if there's risk. And if there's risk, you work as quickly as you can to mitigate the risk so that the decision you make as a team about pursuing is an educated and a calculated one. I mean, there's always going to be a level of risk, but you need to be able to squarely look each other in the eye and say, we understand it and we're going to go after it. Well, then ultimately, when it gets to be selection time, typically one of two things is going to happen. You're going to win or you're going to lose. And everyone says, oh, it's time we, it's time we figure out how to, how, how to make something out of this loss. What are we going to do? You know, let's have one of those, uh, let's have one of those post-mortems. Mm -hmm. But, you know, only the really sophisticated organizations have processes to follow. Nobody really knows what it is. But if you have a go, no go framework that you followed and you evaluated those issues, that you flip that and that becomes your postmortem or your postpartum, uh, your postpartum framework. It's very simple if you follow the process. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. So, so talk to me a little bit about what a go, no go uh, <clears throat> process or a selection process, you know, should look like. Maybe you know a couple of practical steps for people. Yeah, so uh, let's, let's take a look at some of the uh, some of the areas. So, with some of the client issues, uh, um, do you have multi level relationships? Uh, I mean, are you are you looking at a situation where you know, hey, we have John. You know, John worked with us at ABC Company. Here, he's at DEF Company, and he says we're good. So let's run with it, right? Well, are you willing to make that significant investment bet on just John? So it's really important for you to be able to have multi levels of client relationships. And then if you look at the financing and contract area, this is a really, really important one, and one where quite often the sales reps can kind of get lost in the fog, right? Because one of the issues could be that you know the client's demanding contractual guarantees, warranties, and, and penalties, right? Mm -hmm. And you know the, the, the sales credo always is, and you know it well, John, hey, look, don't worry about that. We'll figure that out after we win the deal, right? right? Well, if you do that, if you if you avoid the opportunity to deal with those issues in the pursuit, you may end up winning a deal that you're really sorry that you won. Right. You know, you may you may have projected it at 30 percent margin. And after you win the business and you're signing the contract, you might be fighting to hold on to single digits or worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's a that, that's a key point there because uh, I you know I've seen this first time myself, but you're correct is where, and um, once you really start to do the calculation of the business um, in single digits, sometimes you can be lucky. You can find that it's in the minuses that you've actually just cost yourself money, winning that particular deal because you didn't do um, the proper you know the the proper analysis. Um, so uh, obviously. <clears throat> Um, a critical piece of this is sales management, right? Oh, no, no, no question. Uh, but, you know, the wonderful thing about having a really good process to follow, John, is, yeah, there, there, are some, uh, there are some oversight and some compliance elements to it from a sales standpoint. But if you as a sales manager can get your sales team to, to um, really internalize the concept of go, no go, then some of those issues, they're dealing with them long before the opportunity hits the table. That, that multiple client levels piece, they're w dealing with that in account planning. They know that they need to have more than John as their relationship. So they're building the buyer network. So by the time the opportunity comes out, go, no go has been kind of a mindset in addition to just a framework. Yeah. And I think, and I think the, the really uh, critical piece of this is, is, as you say, is that you're bringing in 
conscious decision making, right? Because you know, let's face it, a lot of the times it's the default is go, right? There's no thought about it. It's just here's an opportunity, we go after it, and if later on down the road we discover that maybe it's not working out, we can get out of it. But the default, there was no point of conscious decision making. It was just like it's a default that we're going to go. Yeah, that's absolutely right. You know, and 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 by having a real having a, having a process based on knowing and really calculating earns you the right to make good decisions because, you know, it can be a gift exiting a deal, you know, getting out of a deal that's not the right deal to pursue can be as quality a decision for your organization as making the decision to go after it. We talk about really earning the right to have early exit or early acceleration. Each one of them is a great decision for your organization. Yeah. So, um, so uh, you know, as you say, there's a comp- there is, there is an oversight and a compliance. How do you though? How do you get this internalized? Um, and how do you get this adopted? Because it is still, you know, some people would still see it as, uh, well, this is another level of, of um, almost like bureaucracy that I, I don't need because I need to be moving fast. Well, I, again, you know, with, with with some lower level deals and maybe some deals that don't have the gravity of a real enterprise deal, maybe moving fast is the right option. And maybe it's simply a sales manager and a sales rep communicating on a real time basis about which deals to go after. But the really significant ones, I mean, you need some adult supervision, to be honest with you. you I mean, you, you need to have legal and you need to have finance involved, not to scotch the deal, not to make a decision not to go after it. But if the decision is to go after it, they, they're they able to put their fingerprints on it early so that it's more likely to be won, as opposed to trying to go to your corporate counsel after you've gotten uh, the verbal and having to tell them, you know what? Yeah, we kind of ignored that issue about penalties. Help me out here, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and that's always a fun conversation. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, um, I think the other thing too is actually, uh, I I think you know the word enterprise and enterprise deal gets thrown around a lot, right? And I often wonder, do people? Uh, here's another point: do people really analyze what an enterprise deal is opposed to a? You might have a deal that's. A, a big deal with a big company with a lot of people, but it could be quite a a simple non complex sale, right? Or you could have a a, a deal with a company that's very complex. Um, do you, do you find that sometimes that people maybe don't really define what enterprise means for them? Oh, no question. It, you know, it, it, it's one of those terms that means different things to different people. But uh, but I mean, you probably know Sandler. Uh, Pretty well, John, and you know that we yeah. believe strongly in the in the power of pain, right? So, mm-hmm. so we define enterprise selling in terms of you know the unique pains and challenges that sales teams experience in the selling into enterprise organizations versus small and medium sized businesses. You know, such as long sales cycles and wide buyer networks. Mm-hmm. And one of the real key ones is the one you and I started talking about early on: the significant investment that you make in the pursuits. That's really what we see as differentiating enterprise opportunities from small and medium business side opportunities. Yeah, and I think that's and I think that's an important clarification. But as you say, I mean, for some businesses, enterprise may be what other companies call smaller medium, right? Depending. Yeah, on no, no, no question. And all of this scales, you know, because go no go needs to be done at whatever level you are. I was chatting with a uh, with a client a couple of weeks ago in Dallas who tells me that every opportunity that she makes a decision to pursue costs their company forty thousand dollars, and that's significant. But you know, if your number is only four hundred, it still scales. You know, if you're a local if you're a local roofing company and you just have to spend four hundred bucks for every deal you go after, you better be making the right bets because it all scales. No. And absolutely, and, and and again, I think that's the I think that's the important part that some people miss sometimes, like what the what the impact of committing resources to something that you're not suited that you I always say you need to have a better than average chance of winning, right? You don't need to it doesn't need to be a certainty, but it needs to be better than average. Like if you're a long shot, right, you shouldn't be going after that. But I think but I think that's a thing that um, you know, sales management, even executive management really need to help uh you know, sales teams internalize, as you say, is the the downside risk of over committing to things that they're not suited to. 
Now, that's a great point, um, because, you know, after a time, if people really do internalize it, they're going to get better and better at identifying opportunities that are more likely to be won. That's really the simple piece of it. Yeah. And doing proper margin analysis up front where it calculates in as many things as possible, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so uh, we're bumping up against the end of our time. But what I wanted to do, Brian, was give you an opportunity to tell the people more about yourself, more about Sandler, what you guys do and how they can contact you. Yeah, so that's great. Thanks, John. So Sandler Training, as I think most people are probably aware of us, a worldwide organization, do sales training and consulting uh, in 30 countries. My responsibility is to manage our enterprise selling piece of the business. And, uh, you know, the book, as you mentioned, it's available on Amazon. And anyone's free to reach out to me at any time. It's brian.sullivan at sandler.com. Be delighted to help anyway, anyone in any way that I could. So thanks so much, John. Great being with you today. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian. And as I said, I'm a big proponent of, of sales training. Yeah, I, I, I ran a sales training company for a while, but I always advocated that even at the end of the day, if we, when we were competing with the Sandlers and other people, I always said that I always hoped that an organization made a decision to go with somebody. Um, even if it wasn't us, because I really believe in in the power of sales training and the fact that um, I don't think sales people are invested enough in. So I would recommend that you go check out Sandler, check out Brian, check out the book. Again, Very good. This is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine Pipeline of CRM. I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.